everyone. My name is Aaron Christensen. Welcome to Horror 101 with Dr. AC, a gathering place for fellow fiends the world over to discuss all things freaky and frightening. If you'd like to be part of the conversation, and I hope you do, I invite you to like this video, subscribe to the channel, maybe go back and check out some of our previous episodes, leave a comment, and most importantly, let us know the fright flicks you'd like to discuss in the future. That kind of engagement is exactly what we're looking for, and it really does make a difference. We're all about sharing the scare, and we want to hear from you. Following the success of Roger Corman's comic exploration of Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, Boris Karloff found himself in high demand with American International Pictures. In addition to The Terror, notoriously shot in two days on The Raven sets, the horror icon appeared in The Comedy of Terrors for Jacques Tenour, alongside Raven co-stars Vincent Price and Peter Lorre, and tonight's selection, the masterful anthology Three Faces of Fear, or as it was better known for its stateside release, Black Sabbath. Director Mario Bava, having made his official directorial debut with Black Sunday in 1960 with AIP, was approached by Sam Arkoff and James Nicholson for another horror offering, this time in color. Bava, having already begun exploring his signature color schemes in Hercules and the Haunted World two years prior, jumped at the chance to work on three separate stories, with Karloff serving not only as the host, but the star of one of the segments. The final results were successful despite, or some might argue because, of AIP's redubbing, reordering, and reshooting pieces of Bava's original cut. We are gathered tonight to celebrate the 60th anniversary of one of my personal favorite Italian horror offerings, a well-polished and extremely atmospheric anthology of fright, perfect for introducing fans to AIP's gothic horrors, as well as Bava's particular visual aesthetic. Joining me in the studio tonight are four of my favorite horror pals. I'd like to introduce David Schmidt, Lawrence P. Raffle, David Lee White, and Niall Arena, and we are here to discuss Black Sabbath from 1963, celebrating its 60th anniversary. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you all for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. Thank Hello. You. Thanks for the history lesson, by the way. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot to say. Uh, I just talked about The Raven recently for a library presentation, and I didn't realize that Karloff had basically been off the screen since 1958. He'd done oh, wow. uh, Frankenstein 1970, Corridors of Blood, but, uh, but he was busy on television. He was hosting uh, The Veil and other things, but he hadn't been on, on uh, the big screen until The Raven, Roger Corman, brought him back. And that kind of brought him back into the AIP fold. And he had a very busy year. Those three films that I named all came out in 1963, The Terror, uh, Comedy of Terrors, and our film tonight, Black Sabbath. Uh, I'd love to just go around really quick and kind of get people's personal experience with Black Sabbath, where they saw it for the first time and what their first impressions were. Uh, David Schmidt, do you mind if we start with you? Oh, sure. Um, I actually took me a long time to catch up with this one. I don't think I caught it until the, the mid 90s, but I was totally blown away by it. Uh, all the, the, the beautiful color and the intense uh, uh, atmosphere of it. And as a filmmaker, I, I'm always incredibly aware of what, how he's moving the camera and, you know, his economic setups and things like that, but, uh, and the little bits of movie magic he throws in. Niall? Well, I, I have kind of a fun story. I was, um, when I was 11 years old, part of a part live show, part kind of like short film screening of my friend who was the, um, the co-owner of Plan 9 Video in Bloomington, Indiana. And um, he showed the um, drop of water segment on 16 millimeter film. The library oh, wow. auditorium had a 16 millimeter prints and they had a print of that as well. And it just scared the bejesus out of me. I, I didn't know what, what I was in for. And for years, that's all I knew it as was just this short film, you know, and I knew Boris Karloff um, from being, you know, a, a horror movie fan as a kid, but also, of course, the Grinch and things like that. His voice, this was obviously the AIP version, but his voice kind of doing that introduction where it's his reflection and there's the drip of, of the water with a, a mirror. Um, and, and what I've read it is Bava directed that segment as well because he was a big in-camera um, kind of visual uh, trickster with his father, Eugenio Bava, having invented, um, I've heard maybe actually the Shukdan technique um, or, or early adopter of it. Anyway, didn't know any of that at the time, just knew that this was this terrifying thing. And uh, then years later, caught it on AMC. 
and found out like, oh, okay, it's it's yeah, part of this anthology film. And it became my go-to in Halloween season in high school. If I had a, a date or a girlfriend to really scare, I would show them just the drop of water segment. Yeah, near and dear to my heart. The whole film is, but that, that segment especially. Great. Let's bump over to Lawrence. Well, I wish I had a really fascinating story to tell, but much like, um, you know, David Schmidt, I didn't really get into Bob until the 90s. I don't really remember. I kind of grew up the video store era. So, like, you know, I would rent a lot of movies from the video store. I don't remember there really being like a large Bava presence at Movies Unlimited or Errol's Video or, you know, West Coast Video. A couple of Argentos, a couple of Fulci's, maybe Zombie 2 or, you know, Cat and Nine Tales. Um, but I didn't really see a lot of Bava's. I think I really started getting into his work. Even like throughout the 90s, I was really big into tape trading. And that's how I kind of was exposed to a lot of horror films that we wouldn't really have been able to see locally i would say i think it was image entertainment that first started to release them on dvd back in the early days of dvd and that's probably what i first started to get into into a lot of his work so it really wasn't until probably the mid to late 90s that i really started to explore his work horror films especially i feel like there are a lot of visionary filmmakers in the horror genre and bava is every single scene is like a painting it's like so much care in you know what is in the background and the colors that he uses and his camera movement. And I really do feel like he's an example of a director where like I could probably watch several of his movies on mute and still enjoy them just for the visual aesthetic. And I mean, when I was younger, you know, we would have like, you know, people come over for parties and sometimes we would throw on a horror movie like a Bava movie or an Argento movie and keep it on mute and just kind of have the visuals up in the background. And, I, and I, re revisiting it after all these years, because when you reached out and you said, oh, how do you feel about Black Sabbath? I was like, well, I haven't watched it in a while, but I'm happy to watch it again and talk hard at any time. And when I revisited it, I was like, wow, this movie is pretty incredible just visually. What a testament to the talent of the filmmaker and a lot of effort that I feel is like, you know, not really matched today by a lot of filmmakers, but just really beautiful to look at. Agreed. David Lee White. Uh, yeah, I am. Um, I'm with Lawrence. I was in the the almost the pre blockbuster video store era. I had grown up and seen Lisa and the Devil and Black Sunday on television, on syndicated television. So I didn't know who they, I didn't know who Mario Bubble was. But uh, you know, I probably learned about that through early video watchdog issues, right? I remember for years searching for Black Sunday or and or Lisa and the Devil in every video store I went to and I would get to the horror section and go B B B B black 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 sabbath oh and that was <laughs> that black sabbath was always there and black sunday was never there so for me black sabbath at the time was kind of the consolation prize <laughs> it, it wasn't what I was looking for but I'll watch it I mean it's by the same guy you know so I think it took me a long time to really become impressed with it um you know it's after i found those two movies and was able to go back to it and put everything into uh, uh proper context but certainly uh watching it recently and i haven't seen it probably for 20 years and i watched you know both versions I, it's it's just so impressive there's not a bad shot in the entire film you know it's just, as you've all said, you know, Bob is just a gorgeous filmmaker. You know, you can take any frame and put it on your wall. And that's something I've always been impressed with. David, you are kind of key to my, uh, I have I have here a printout of an article you wrote called A Brief History of Italian Horror. Oh my God. That was in the July 98 uh, Horrorwood webzine. I hang on to this. It's like, kind of like still my, my go-to uh, to be like, well, what did David think of this movie? I don't even have a copy of that. <laughs> uh, and so, I, and you actually were the one who provided me with my first bootleg copy of Black Sunday. Oh. Uh, and I was like, oh my gosh, like this movie came out in 1960. And I remember that iron mask being pounded onto the face of Barbara Steele and thinking that is as indelible an image as, you know, the shower scene in Psycho. But then you fast forward three years, and this is Bava's first horror title in color. Mm -hmm. uh, because he'd done Hercules in the Haunted World, which was kind of like playing around that fantasy realm. And there's some great color gel uh, examples in there. 
But this film is just wonderful. And I first encountered it, uh, like you, Niall, on AMC when they had kind of their like uh, horror marathons in October. Like you, A Drop of Water was like that, that image of the woman on the bed. I was like, that's right up there with like uh, House on Haunted Hill, the little creepy, you know, maid who, who rolls by. It's just in terms of like fun but visceral images. We're like, I'm never going to forget that. That was incredible. Has everybody seen both versions, both the AIP and the Italian version? Yeah. 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 Obviously the AMC one was the AIP version. So that was the one I kind of grew up watching. And so when I finally got around to seeing the Italian version, like the fact that you don't get to hear Karloff's voice was just kind of like, oh, wow, what a trade-off. Uh, what were people's reactions when, I mean, which one did you encounter first, I guess, for the, is the first question. Oh, uh, well, I, I, I encountered the AIP one first because it was on, you know, whatever stateside video cassette yeah, mm -hmm. it was out on. I don't think I saw the Italian one. I read certainly read about the Italian one much longer before I actually saw it. But I will say that this, I had kind of half forgotten that they were vastly different. And the other night... You can stream the AAP version for free where, where I'm at. You know, it's a mm -hmm. really good copy, you know, on Xfinity. It's a really looks great. And I watched it. And I love the movie. And only after it was over did I go, I wonder if, wasn't there something different? And by sheer <laughs> chance, I went to a used record store the next day. And they had the Itali the Kino Blu-ray, <laughs> the Italian for four bucks. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I got it and watched it last night. And I, and I really do think the Italian one is superior. It's that music score and it's the telephone. The telephone in the AIP version is just weird. It doesn't <laughs> make a whole lot, make a whole lot of sense. It feels like a placeholder. Whereas in the Italian one, I feel like it kind of ramps into the movie a little better, you know. I completely yeah. agree on on that. Uh, I just 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 watching the uh, AIP version this afternoon after watching the Italian version, I was thinking, well first of all, he's the caller is so much more aggressive in the Italian version. It isn't, you know, in the AIP version, it's, I'm going to come, I'm going to possess you, I'm I'm going to take you and things like that. But he's, you know, straight up in the Italian version, I'm going to take you and then I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you over and over again. It's much more aggressive, much more frightening. And I, and I, as much as I love Les Baxter as a composer, I think the other score is much creepier. I think the Les Baxter has kind of a, it almost sounds more like a crime drama, kind of this mm. metropolitan jazz thing. And I, I don't think it's as effective. Well, the, the, the story is that Les Baxter recorded this entire score in one studio session. Wow. <laughs> like it, it was like, okay, we're going to bang out. It's an hour, an hour's worth of music. And I, I agree. It does feel like lesser Les Baxter. Cause I, I love Les Baxter, but I feel like this is him going, Okay, I have an hour. Okay, great. Let me just uh, crank this out, and boom. Uh, well, I can't and imagine I, he had much more time than that for something like uh, the Dunwich Horror. I'm sure Roger Corman did not give him a lot of time or money for that. <laughs> and I really do like this score, especially in the telephone. That's where it's the most noticeable, the, the difference. It's kind of like this great kind of jazzy score, which Les Baxter does really well, but it, it feels like it's, a, it's just a better, more accomplished piece. I agree with what everyone said so far. I feel like the, and I feel this is true anytime a foreign movie is recut or redubbed for an American audience. I feel like whoever's doing this thinks that they're showing the American audience what they want to see and, you know, letting the American audience hear what they want to hear while also trying to keep some kind of a decency standard in place. And I feel like in the American version of the telephone, it, to me, it feels very obvious that that's what's happening. And I think that's, for me, that's what kind of cheapens a little bit. I often have an appreciation for an American cut or an American dub over the original language cut or dub just to see how different, you know, audiences interpret different material. And But I do feel like in this particular instance, it feels like it's a very sort of like dumbed down version for an American audience that adheres to a specific standard or like decency standard. And it, it just feels very apparent. So I would say normally I, I can have an appreciation for an American dub or an American cut, but in this one, I, I can't say that I have much of an appreciation for it. <laughs> Telephone obviously suffers the most in, in my impression between AIP versus the original, the Italian or Euro cut. The Vortilac actually holds up in both. You get the severed head more and things like that. 
Um, and drop of water, I think, is beyond language. And and then that one is <laughs> is is so purely terrifying that actually AIP told uh, Bava that he had to add something to the end originally, which is how both the you know, kind of goofy part of the end of the Italian version comes, but also why I think it was moved to uh, first for the American release, the AIP release. Uh, but yeah, I think the score is definitely stronger in the telephone. Obviously, it doesn't really make much sense. The one thing I do like in the AIP uh, telephone is the ghost writing on the letter, like how, just how odd that is. And that it, it does kind of, you know, because it doesn't really make sense, um, especially <laughs> for what happens. Like he's a ghost, but he has to kill people um but the ghost writing i remember seeing it on on television um and it really did scare me the idea that a ghost could deliver something and then like it's going to kind of write something threatening kind of before your eyes so that animation gives me the willies but i don't think that rescues it well neither of them makes a lot of sense and, and i've heard it referred to as kind of like a proto giallo and i'm kind of like meh there's a bit of a mystery quality to it but it's not it doesn't fall in line with what i imagine a giallo is but the idea that, you know, where is Mary, you know, the the her her lover, that she's able to observe any of this because she calls her at home. You know, it's not like she's like in the other room a la Black Christmas. You know, like she's at home. And I'm like, well, how does she do all the thing where I can see you in the dress? And why did you change your why did you hide your it's like, well, that she makes... looks across the street as a telescope. Well, <laughs> but, then she, but then she calls her as Ma as the killer, and it's like, why were you just talking to Mary? So it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like you can't have it all. Like it just, you know, no. doesn't work that way. I did read one note uh, uh, while I was doing research on uh, the film, and they mentioned specifically that the, the AIP producers thought that the Italian version was fine for a more adult uh, European audience, but they, they were shooting for a teenage audience and they wanted it to uh, honed towards a teenage sensibility. Well, and I understand that, like the idea of eliminating the, the lesbian angle, but in just in terms of it making sense I, for me, like I'm fine. I'd much rather have a ghost because I'm like, okay, I can buy that. What I can't buy is somebody <laughs> peeking through the blinds and then running home and answering the phone and that you are disguising yourself as Frank's voice when clearly you're not, you know, you're covering it with the little magic napkin or whatever. Yes, they eliminated some things for it, but that even in the AIP version, telephone is still pretty pervy. I mean, mm. you know, there's the the phone call, I can see you, show me your lay. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it, the whole thing because of the Les Baxter score and Baba's kind of interstitials which aren't there in the italian version the thing does have kind of a saturday afternoon kind of horror movie for teenager feel hmm. until you get to the telephone where it's like i can see your silky flesh you know um so there is something a little off about that yeah so and the fact that it's Mary who's talking about you know her her fabulous legs and and right, her right. body and things like that, but also, also kind of to the... speaks to their inability to really cut the movie the way that they intended to cut it because it's still pretty salacious. So it's like, well, what are you trying to do here? It's like you missed this part, but you caught this part. It's like we can't handle this, but we can handle that. I yeah, feel like the salaciousness is not necessarily the problem. It was mostly just the lesbian quality. Like you know, it's fine for a man to be ogling a woman. You know, hello, male gaze yeah, from 1963. Right, right. Uh, when I was watching this, my wife was watching it too, and she's like, "It gets to the shot of where they cut away. They've gone to bed, and they cut, cut away, from, and Mary's doing the writing, and uh, Rosie is laid out on the bed. She says, oh, wow, this is text. This is not, not subtle at all.' Okay, <laughs> <laughs> she looks very satiated. <laughs> well, and there was, yeah, because we miss Mary's arrival in the AAP version. We don't get to yeah. see that. Instead, we see this weird kind of scene with the neighbor, right? Yeah. Yes, um, that 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 kind of comes in, and there. But there is there's something about, and this is really subtle, and maybe I'm I'm reaching too hard, but um, I can't remember our protagonist's name. Not Mary, but Rosie. 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 Um, Rosie seems less innocent in the Italian version. There, I, I mean, I know in the other one, she put her husband away still, like that's still there. But then there's this kind of unexplained, not only did she put her husband away, but she was having an affair with his 
X or something. And there just seems like this really kind of like, you know, th this air of perversion kind of circling around everything that maybe is not quite as evident in the AIP version, which makes us feel maybe less, uh, it, it, Rosie seems less innocent, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Well, yeah, I, I think, David, too, that at least what I've read is that um, she's meant to be a prostitute in the Italian version, like without any subtlety, like the, oh. you know, the illusions uh, um, that Mary has, like, oh, obviously, you know, you're too good for me because you're the mistress of these guys. But mistress being this kind of at least I think in the Italian, it's kind of lost. But the idea is just like basically this kind of high end uh, sex worker for whatever kind of euro executives and that frank <laughs> was not just her boyfriend but her pimp and that's how she was able to kind of have the goods on him to put him away interesting i i, I can see her as a kept woman and that makes sense with the ridiculously opulent things that fill up this, this small studio basement apartment right. i mean that bed is a throne it's amazing <laughs> well and that uh, that actually that was the first thing i noticed even before i started to get into the story i was like look at the tchotchkes a lot of artifacts right yeah yeah that i that was the most impressive visual thing to me about that whole thing was everywhere you looked you know i wanted to go through that apartment and just go through the stuff you know and that's something that strikes me about every one of these stories as I, as I was watching at this time was just how detailed all the backgrounds were and what those things were saying about the characters and the story yeah. whether it's the the overrun cat lady you know faded opulent building that the the dead woman is in or mm. the the peasantry uh wholesome you know solid you know uh, people of the land kind of quality of the the Vordlack house the telephone kicks off the Italian version, and it's the middle section of the AIP version. I really like Drop of Water kicking things off for the AIP because it really does get you into it. And and I think because in the AIP version, the telephone is the weakest of the bunch. And so to kind of sandwich it between two really strong ones works very well. I think if you'd start off with the telephone, it might not have worked as well for the AIP version. When I rewatched the Italian version this time through, the Italian version had the edge in terms of the ordering, but not by a ton. I think I did prefer the Italian one, but I could certainly see how the AIP execs sat around and went, oh, we really have to put Drop of Water first. I think I do prefer the original ordering. I feel like they kind of build. I think the... In, with uh, the Italian version, I think each one is a little scarier, and we mm. end on the, the nice big bang of the last one. Yeah, I agree with both of those statements. I, honestly, I would say, cause to me, it, it feels like the telephone and drop of water are the, I don't know if this is true, I didn't time them, but they feel shorter, and I feel like as bookends, it works better that way. And especially having drop of water to kind of finish it off, I mean, I think it's the strongest of the three. And honestly, like when I rewatched it, I had completely forgotten about that visual of like the frozen screaming old woman. And as soon as it came on, I was like, oh yeah. Like <laughs> also like that, like the head on the stake in the in the middle store. I was like, oh yeah, the head on the stake. That's you see it everywhere, but it's like you forget about that stuff. And like I completely forgot about that visual until I saw it again. I was like, it's just so strong. But I do think I feel as bookends, they work better. In terms of the kind of the tenor of Karloff's presence in the AIP version versus the Italian version. He set up kind of at doing his, his thriller slash veil, you know, television host leading you into this anthology. The fact that he's in the Vertilock, that seems to make the most sense for me for it to be the closer. It's kind of like I'm introducing, I'm introducing, and now I'm inserting myself into the story. And then he doesn't, you know, he doesn't come back out for a curtain call. We just go to credits. Saving the star for the... The yeah, the, yeah, yeah. That idea yeah. of like he's in the final one. He's he's the headliner, so we're going to save him for last. So. Yeah, it certainly makes sense. It is one of those things where I can absolutely see why the why the decision was was made, and I'm not quite sure why I prefer the other version. I'm pretentious, and so I like the <laughs> awesome. Yeah, there is something about the Italian one that works for me slightly better, but I absolutely can appreciate going to the movie theater in 1963 and like sitting there and wanting that one to be first, wanting drop of water to be first and wanting, you know, for like saving Carlo for the end. And also you get to hear his voice. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll, that's we'll that's a big deal. Yeah, that's such yeah. a big thing, especially that he still introduces the the Italian version that that he comes on. The disappointment that it's not just like well, in the Vortilac, you know, he he is kind of the character, and so he's speaking in Italian. And it's not his voice, but but everyone's clearly dubbed just because they didn't shoot sound. You know, that's how they made those films so quickly. They were building the sets or they were doing other things. They were able yeah. to keep it going. But the fact that he comes on, ah, please, and it's just this <laughs> different voice. And you're like, oh no. And, like, I, and he says, io be a beautiful Boris Karloff. And I'm like, you're not Boris Karloff. You're a strange, it's like seeing the Simpsons in a different language. You're like, oh no, this is, <laughs> something's, something's wrong. Well, it's kind of yeah. like when you see uh, Christopher Lee, right? In, um, What's the whip in the body? Oh yeah, and you yeah, and yeah. You, you hear an Italian voice coming out of Christopher Lee's mouth. And you're like, I just there's just certain you know faces and voices that you just don't expect them to ever get separated. Yeah, uh, Aldo Silvani was our our actor who uh, who dubbed Boris Karloff, and he was a, oh. he was a busy Italian actor. He has like a hundred credits on IMDb, so I'm sure the Italian audiences were totally fine with it. They're like, ah, Aldo, our friend. <laughs> I, also, I think it adds a certain kind of element of charm to it too because like i feel like it's like the anti-american dubbing of foreign films the mm-hmm. idea of hearing like an american actor in another voice kind of like i don't think it's as you don't see it as often so i feel like it's it does add a certain level of charm to it it's a little comical as you know niall kind of illustrated but i also think it just you know it's a little charming yeah. i wonder if he regularly dubbed karloff in italy Mm, he was just the person they, they went to, so they, that's the voice they would have associated with him. Yeah, that's true. That's because yeah, like people like Schwarzenegger and Tom Cruise, like they have that person that always dubs them, so it's it's familiar to that audience. Like that's what that person sounds like. Let us jump forward to the Bertolock. I love the fact that it's it's the one time that Boris Karloff plays a vampire in his career, and he is a creepy vampire. You know, there's no fangs and cape here. Like he's just like this scary beast who who feasts on his family. Well, and that first scene with the little boy, where he's got the little boy. <laughs> like, Let me give you a kid. You know, it's, it so does that. I, I, it's so disturbing. And I had forgotten what happened in that story. I remember, mm. I you know, and so I did through this time going, wait, the the little boy. No, you know, and and um, uh, and I couldn't remember like who gets away if anyone gets away. I could, I got really invested uh, in it. And Karloff is he's just marvelous. I'm just as a side note, I'm a huge fan of old Boris Karloff. Mm. I like his later performance, I love Corridor of Blood, you yeah. know, and and all of even those uh, Mexican films he did, what well, all of his scenes were isolated, you know, and filmed in California somewhere. Love them. I just, so, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, in Targets, too. Like, even yeah, though yeah, yeah, great in that. I'll watch anything with old Boris Karloff in it. I just, well, having great. just seen The Raven, where he, you know, like he, he's coming down the stairs, and you could see that, you know, like that's a painful for him because his knees were so bad at that point. And I was <laughs> speaking of the kid, it's like when he has to pick up that kid and carry him, I'm like, Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. Somebody else get in there. Well, let's, well, let's point out, though, they they ch- murdered that child pretty pretty fast. For 1963, that's, yeah. a little, that's a little unusual. And then you have that wonderful, oh, oh. mama, I'm cold. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would I put that that's that shot of him like against the door, like right up there with like Salem's lot of the kid in the window. I'm like, that's creepy. Yeah. Like this kid just kneeling at the door and going, let me in. Well, and there's that moment, and I don't I, this is not necessarily a conscious thing on Baba's part, but you know, the, the little kid is at the door, and then when she opens the door, right, it's it's him. It's the grand and it reminded me of that scene in Shock or Beyond the Door 2, oh, yeah. where the little kid is running at them and then suddenly <laughs> ah, and the father's there. Well, it's funny, you know, the scene where uh, Mark Damon is kissing and she's called Sedenka in the Italian version, she's called Stenya in the uh, AIP version. I'm kind of like, I okay, thanks for <laughs> changing that up. But when Damon comes in to kiss her, and I was like, how great would it be for him to pull back and it be Karloff? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that Karloff just shapeshifts. Or it's Frank or whatever his name is from the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What I can't get over, and I think 
I, I was aware of him, you know, being a, a good Hoosier. Um, and so he was kind of our one, besides Letterman, maybe unobjectionable patron saint. But how much Karloff looks like Kurt Vonnegut with the, the droopy mustache oh, wow. and the curly yeah. hair. And so to have that kind of, and he was such a folksy, grandfathery, humanist figure, especially around Indiana University and everything. And so to have it be kind of not just the perversion of the, the you know, grandfatherly person for the family twisting, you know, into the thing that kills them all. But also it's like, oh man, it's it's Vonnegut. Can we take a second to talk about his entrance? Because they yes. build it up so beautifully with him coming into the horse and then yeah. kind of limping towards them and they're following his legs and things like that. It just really, when they turn, it's a really great first impression. Yep, and that, that snap character. zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and also we have that great chiming of the bells where it's like, and he shows up like just after the last chime. <laughs> Which again, midnight in the Italian version, 10 o'clock in the AIP version. I'm like, really? Uh, but like he shows up just moments after that last bell. And that's why it kind of heightens the suspense where you're like, did he, did he make it in time? Does he, is, is it okay? Is it not? Uh, I think we quickly get an idea that it's probably not okay. Especially <laughs> when he talks about fondling his grandson. It's hard not to read it as some kind of metaphor for destructive, toxic family, destroying mm. a pattern, abuse of some kind. The moment when you know everything's going to go south for everyone is when, is it Maria refuses to dispose of the child? Yeah. 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 It becomes a story about the seeds of destruction kind of living within themselves and that yeah. they, you know, are refuse they cannot overcome their familial bonds enough to put an end to everything. And, to, and so once that happens, it's all over. You know? yeah. It reminded me of uh, Bob Clark's dead of night where the wife, you know, is, is defends her dead son against her husband. Yeah. And I was like, Oh wow. Like they, like to me, there's nothing more terrifying than that. Where like a family member turns on the other dead of night. Also a guy with a big mop of gray hair <laughs> who does some <laughs> terrible things. <laughs> a couple of moments where like, you know, they all kind of just like go with the flow as things are happening. And you can pinpoint a couple of moments. Where somebody should have said, wait a second, something's not quite right here. Maybe we need to have a conversation about this, <laughs> but you know, the, I guess the family bond is so strong that they're just kind of like, you know, going with it, but there are definitely yeah. some moments where, and, you know, just to comment on Boris Karloff real quickly, he is great, but, you know, I think this is a, a good example where, and not really kind of, you know, placing it where in his career this was made, but this is an example of, you know, a, a job he could have just taken as a job and like phoned it in. And, um, and he doesn't do that. Um, and even yeah. in the Italian language version, it's still a very strong performance, which again, I think speaks to his ability as an actor with, you know, presence and facial expressions and whatnot, to really be able to pull that off. Um, but like he could have just, you know, come in, gotten a check and walked away, but he really does give it a lot of effort. Yeah. Well, he could have even just been the host for it. And the fact that he, you know, decided, said that he would do the, the segment. And I really like this as a showcase for Karloff because it shows him as the gentleman and it also shows him as the monster. And I don't know that we got to see that that often. Like he was either one or the other. Yeah. But here we really get to see the talent that he was. Uh, oh, before you go off, Vertil, I no, just yep. as a footnote, when I when I found that Kino Blu-ray yesterday, I also found Giorgio Ferrono's Ferroni's Night of the Devils, which oh. is another version of the Vertilac. I watched the first half. I was pretty bored. It's interesting as a footnote in that is it, it is a full length film based mm -hmm. on the same story. And her name is Zdenka in that. So uh, that must be from the original uh, Gogol story. That beautiful effect shot of the uh, monastery, nunnery, whatever it is that they end up taking yes. shelter in. Um, there's this beautiful, you know, uh, big interior shot of the ruins that they come into the, uh, the foreground, I think, on the, the screen, right, screen left uh, side. But it's clear that the rest of that frame is mostly model shot. I think they're using a mirror or something like that. And they mm. they have, uh, I think, Karloff in the foreground of that at one point, too, which even sells the depth of it really well. It's a great shot. Well, we've commented on the art direction a couple times. I mean, it really is. It's a magnificent looking film. You know, the lights, 
the, uh, the the production design, etc. Like it just the costumes, uh, because the costumes. I, I was thinking specifically about the telephone. You know, like Michelle Mercier, Mercier, however you say her name. Like she's gorgeous in all three. She's in that black gown, then she's in that terry cloth robe, then she's in that white chiffon night shift, and you're like. You look amazing in all of them. <laughs> and she keeps taking them off. <laughs> Mark Damon, who plays for our hero, Vladimir, in uh, Verdelock, he starred opposite Vincent Price for Fall of the House of Usher for Corman, the, right. the first A.I. Poe. But then he later became a producer and he produced such things as Nine and a Half Weeks, Schlock, <laughs> The Neverending Story, Short Circuit, and Wild Orchid. So he kind of covered the gamut as a producer. He was like, you know, let's do some kitty fair over here and then let's do some porn over here. It'll be great. Crazy. <laughs> Pushing on into uh, Drop of Water, which we've talked about a bit, but let us let us lean into because that one I had forgotten. The woman's kind of mansion that she visits, like those incredibly tall ceilings and the cats running around and the light coming in, you know, different colored light just kind of coming in from nowhere. Like that feels like you've entered some kind of nightmare. And they keep layering on, you know, different creepy elements of that, whether it's the lamp that just keeps coming down onto the, the shift or the, uh, the flies or, you know, all the other kinds of things that are fluttering around. And you'd be hard pressed to think that anything is an accident there. Like every single thing has to be like, you know, planned and thought out and, Really, even when you mentioned the light, how it, like the light that, that keeps falling, it really is just like a moment where you're just like, you're just like drawn to this light that just keeps falling. And it's just really like something as small as that to kind of set the tone and set the mood. It was really effective. Well, and there may have been, this may have been true for all three, but I noticed it really specifically in Drop of Water is that Bob is doing that Baba thing where he's got a diff different colored light in every room and we're in the main room but then there's a hallway over here and there's kind of a flashing blue light over here and then over here there's a window and something outside the window is causing a flashing red light and and there is this feeling that it's a lot that the atmosphere is just alive the uh, manipulation of the lighting is never stagnant you know he's never just like shining a light on something there's always got to be something flashing or moving and you see that a lot in and blood and black lace even more pronounced mm -hmm. um but i i really noticed it in drop of water this time now mind you i'm not sure completely sure that some of that isn't that they're reusing the same walls over and over again and just <laughs> lighting them differently so you don't notice but <laughs> that, yeah. yeah 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 i love the fact that miss chester our main character played by jacqueline peru like her apartment is next to this flashing green neon sign like, it's just, that's just, every night is like that. It's just like, yep, there's no real sleep to be had. Uh, you know, and she's a nurse and she's called away to prepare this uh, woman who has recently died. She's a medium, uh, prepare her for her funeral. And uh, the, the old woman was performing a seance and, you know, dropped dead. And you come in and you're like, Oh yeah, that woman encountered something not good at all because it has frozen her face into this mask. And that mask was designed by Eugenio uh, Bava as well, uh, a sculptor, uh, Mario's dad. But that image, I love that mask image. And I was so okay. glad that I never saw it in any reference books prior to encountering it for the first time. So I, I came to it very fresh. I love that image. It, it's funny how it harkens back. I was just watching, I think, because they're all on the Criterion channel right now, but I was watching Tales of Terror, the Matheson-written AIP, Roger Corman, in the AI Poe sequence, but how that last one, the um, events around M. Valdemar or something, but where yeah, the, the yeah, man, you know, the, is... Yes, he's... Mes but how much that plot kind of mirror, mirrors at least the plot device in Drop of Water, where if yeah. you know, someone dies during a seance, he, of course, is mesmerized and intentionally left mesmerized at the point of death but it was yeah. funny how those two you know the catalyst is if, for both this kind of um you know reaching to the the beyond but you know bringing back something that you shouldn't and then human greed carrying it forward in in both of course it's the theft in drop of water yeah but uh i thought that was interesting like oh yeah for for two anthology films that are 
pretty close in time together from the same company. I'm really glad you brought up uh, Tales of Terror because that anthology format had kind of gone by the wayside. Like we had not, we hadn't seen a lot of anthology films since like Dead of Night, 1945. Like Tales of Tales of Terror was kind of innovative in that regard. And it, part of it was that, you know, they were like, well, Matheson was like, uh, how can I do, you know, shorter versions instead of trying to stretch these, these post stories out to feature length movies? Can we do shorter versions of them? But because Tales of Terror was such a hit, they wanted to do another anthology film. That's why they approached uh, Baba with the idea of doing these three. One led to the other. And it's funny because Tales of Terror, the, the comic middle section, is what led to The Raven happening. Huh. Because they did the comedy of Peter Lorre and Vincent Price as kind of the two wine folks. And <laughs> The Raven is what got Karloff in. And then Karloff ended up doing Black Sabbath. So you see, it's all a tapestry. <laughs> I don't want the moment to go by without pointing out my my favorite weird moment in Drop of Water. And it's before you really have an idea of what's going on and the corpse is going after our main <laughs> character and she's doing this. Mm -hmm. And like because and we know now from what we see that she, the corpse or perhaps her own insanity is causing her to want to strangle herself to death, yeah. Yeah. but she's fighting it. Her one hand is trying to grab her neck and her other hand is like pushing it away. And you're like, what is she doing? And yeah. it's this incredible moment of, uh, it, it, it's almost like in a David Lynch movie where you go, why is that character behaving <laughs> that way? You right, know? Right. Um, and then yeah. of course there's an explanation for it and it makes sense. Well, and, fun uh, fact, David Lynch is a huge fan. Oh yeah, of this movie? Yes, yes. In fact, there's there's a part uh, that's missing from Twin Peaks Fire Walk with Me that is in some of you know the giant complete thing where Heather Graham has this ring and it's much like the <gasps> oh, ring. Oh right, of yeah. course. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. He pays homage to the end of Kill Baby Kill in uh, the season two uh, ender of Twin Peaks with the protagonist running away from chasing himself, catching up to himself you know, with the doppelganger, it's really, oh, that's great. I totally forgot about that. Martin Scorsese talks about uh, this film and Kill Baby Kill as films that he has stolen shots from. There's a scene in Kill Baby Kill where the camera kind of follows the, the witch character. She's dealing with the cursed girl and it, it like goes between like three different setups back and forth. Uh, and I'm like, I am sure I've seen that in some other film. The other association is that apparently Quentin Tarantino and Roger Avery loved Black Sabbath and talked about making a crime version of that. That hmm. originally they, the Pulp Fiction was going to be three separate stories. Tarantino was going to direct one. Roger Avery was going to direct one. Somebody else was going to direct something else. But they eventually mishmashed that and it turned out the way they did. And I could kind of see that with Quentin Tarantino because he worked in a video store in this era. Of course he would have seen it. But that's so interesting about Scorsese because, you know, it's not as if these movies were taught in film schools, right? Like they had to be influenced by them by going to see them at drive-ins and, you know, and grindhouses and things like that. Um, which I think is just fascinating. It's not as if in the, you know, the 60s, 70s, or really until the 90s that people were studying Mario Bava yeah. as an influence. You know? well, he has mentioned the going to see Hammer films in the theater as a kid, and the time he saw the Hammer logo, was really excited that it was going to be a special movie. I only have fun facts from here on out. Our, our woman who we see at the very end, the one who discovers uh, Jacqueline Peru, uh, she shows up, uh, her name is... Harriet Medine, and she shows up in Death Race 2000, which I was like, that because I remember seeing Death Race 2000 going, why do I know her? Because she has such an amazing face. And I think it's fascinating that like we have these Italian and these, these French and then these American character actresses that are all shooting this, this you know, Italian uh, horror anthology, which presumably was shot in Italy. You know, the idea that they, that, you know, like where, how did... How did she get over there? Right. And, and John it, Saxon and all these other guys that used yeah. to do this stuff. It was even filmed on location for um, um, the Vortilac in an area called the City of the Dead. It was kind of, you know, this ghost town. And Boris Karloff contracted pneumonia um, 
but apparently he had such a good time that when uh, there was some talk that he and Christopher Lee would be in the Dunwich Horror together and Bava was attached to direct, he said, I would do anything for Mario Bava. I love him. <laughs> so had a good time, apparently. Yeah. Well, and that does bring us to the end of the Italian version where he's clearly having a good time <laughs> uh, because it kind of explodes the whole idea of cinema and fantasy. And by pulling the camera back and showing the illusion and showing that it's just people, uh, you know, crew members running around with branches and you see that, you know, his horse is fake and he's just on this little thing. Uh, what are people's thoughts on that? I love that ending. I do too. I, I, I know that it was, they thought the end of Drop of Water was so harsh that they wanted to, to soften it up a little bit. And it's, let's, you know, I just want to drop in, you know, the end of, of uh, Drop of Water, the implication that this is just going to be a cycle of, of ongoing curse is pretty marvelous. Yeah. Um, but uh, I kept I, watching it this time. I kept wondering, um, is, is, this, is this just the, hey, kids, this is just a movie. Hey, censors, don't take this too seriously. Or is there some attempt to say something about everything's an illusion, fear is an illusion? I don't know. I mean, you know, Bob always strikes me as a very kind of instinctive filmmaker a lot of times that he doesn't always necessarily know where it's coming from, but he puts it out there anyway because it feels right, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, it wouldn't, you know, I think all those things are, are possible reads of that. It's a, it's a great moment, you know, I'm not sure what, and it's the music too, that goes along with it. You know, this kind of like carousel kind of thing. I think it's the one place where we could have used less Baxter's in credit music, the accelerated, the dun, 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 it could have, <laughs> the kind of galloping, rollicking thing. The only other, you know, thought I have, and I believe it had to have some impact on the ending of Holy Mountain, right? Because that's it's the oh, wow. same. It's the same ending, um, huh. more or less. I mean, it's not the exact same, but it's it's the panning out and seeing the crew, and it's you know kind of this this joke on. And it's been a long time since I've seen Holy Mountain all the way through, um, but you know I believe the last you know words are like, and of course you end with a movie or something like that, and it zooms out from Jodorowsky, and you see, you know, the crashing uh, you know pieces. So. I don't know if this is the only source or, you know, I don't want to, you know, go out and say this is definitely, you know, Holy Mountain's an homage to Black Sabbath. That feels a little bold, but they're, they're <laughs> splashing in the same stream as a kind of wink that, you know, we are, you know, the, the magic makers and, you know, the, the fantasy is part of the joy or whatever is there. See, and again, I'm going to go, I like my horror, you know, straight. I like to leave with the illusion intact. And so for me, it's a little jarring like that. It, that I, I love I love the sentiment of it, but it feels almost like if they ran a blooper reel right after a, a like hereditary, you know, like something that's just, just awesome and terrifying. And then suddenly it's like, hey, we're just kidding, 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 kidding. You know, it's like this isn't the cannibal run here, guys. Like, like, <laughs> let me let me enjoy the mood. That, I mean, because the thing is, like, he's created an incredible mood for 90 minutes. And then to kind of explode it like this, like it just, it, it's a weird disorienting feeling. And again, I liked the message. I just think I would have liked to have let it land a little longer, you know, perhaps if we'd run credits and then we had that as kind of a coda, that would have been more satisfying to me. Like, it's like a magician going, and here's how I did that trick. Just, you know, <laughs> right, right. I'm like, right. Oh, I, I, I liked it better when I, when I didn't know. I think it works because it's part of the wraparound. And I think often in anthologies that have wraparounds, the wraparound tends to be the weakest part anyway. Mm. So not that that's necessarily a commentary on that, but I do feel like it, I don't think it demeans the ending of drop of water or any of the other stories. And it does come off a little goofy, but I think because it's part of the wraparound, it kind of works because the wraparound, even at the beginning of the movie, it almost kind of takes on like a William Castle vibe. He's like, vampires yeah, yeah. are everywhere. There could be a vampire sitting next to you in this theater. I'm like, is this supposed to be William Castle? Is he trying right. to do Twilight Zone? Like, what's kind of happening here? So yeah. I think if you kind of tie it into that, it kind of works. And it yeah. doesn't really feel that off base, I think. There's a lighthearted tone to it for sure. And I mean, we were we were four years into the Twilight Zone at this point. So, I mean, we were very used to having those movies introduced or those uh, stories introduced to us by a kind of wry narrator. So that that part of it went 
went down fine. And again, I, you know, not to, not to say I really like that moment. It just feels like it comes so quickly upon, again, the strongest, scariest moment. And I didn't know that, David, if that may, I mean, maybe that is David Schmidt. Like that is what his idea was that we don't want to leave you too scared. We don't want you, we don't want you, you know, going home at night and being worried. We want you to realize that, hey, we were just telling a story. It was just for fun. Everybody grab your marshmallows and go back to your tents. I was thinking of censors too, because there's a lot of stuff with tone. I, uh, reading the book on uh, the production for Hammer films, they were always struggling with the censors going, no, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. Oh no, just the tone of this movie overall is too much. It, you know, and and I wonder if this kind of attempt to throw a lighthearted ending on it was a way to you know try to protect the the scarier parts of the film no that that mm-hmm. and that's that seems legitimate that you're like it was just that we're just go- we're just goofing here so you can't take this too seriously it puts the burden on the censor like the censor doesn't want to look stupid <laughs> after yeah. that uh, we would be remiss not to mention that ozzy osbourne you know back when he was in the band earth Happened to be uh, looking out his hotel room window, as as the anecdote goes, and saw that the line to Black Sabbath, the movie, was longer than the line to his concert. <laughs> and he's like, horror sells. And uh, hence, Black Sabbath was born, the band. It's a good thing he saw the, the cue for that, not Dr. Goldfoot and the McKe- bikini machine. <laughs> machine. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all better off. Maybe, maybe not. If there isn't a band already called Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine, I'm starting one. One more thought on the film. One of the things that, uh, as we were sitting there watching it going, the least uh, believable thing in the movie that kept jumping out at me during uh, the telephone was the fact that the main character never shuts her curtains. <laughs> she's, she knows she's being spied on. <laughs> He turns all the lights down, puts the lamp down down, off. She looks through the shades, but she never pulls the curtains shut repeatedly. I'm like, what are you doing? How would we get that amazing, you know, purple light coming through the window? (laughs) I'm sure it's the the rationale. Unless it has the slats, it it doesn't look right. But it's like written by a man. Right. (laughs) Any woman would have gone, shut the curtains, take the phone off the hook. Where's my knife? Right. Right. (laughs) Well, if we're going to nitpick because the, the the dog in the Italian version where it's just the ar, 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 it's that canned werewolf sound yes. that we, and we just like on repeat and again, kudos to AIP because they make it more of a dog sound and it's a mournful dog sound that is like, I'm troubled by something. Whereas like, I don't know, like it just felt like they got, you know, terror on tape you know, and, and played that same cue over and over again for the Italian version. I did notice that. I'd forgotten it until you brought it up. But yes, that stuck me last night. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little uh, disappointed that they changed the drop of water sound in the mm. AIP version. I don't think yeah. it's mixed quite as sharply uh, as it is in the Italian version. Like it does become this escalating kind of nightmare for her after she's stolen the ring and she's home. Because, I mean, really what's scary is the, the witch in her bed, but it, it gets heightened by all of these little indicators of the drop of water. And I, I just, I love that, that build. And the fake dead fly that, you know, they somehow managed to keep it, make look like it's real because of the sound effects and her reactions to it. This time through, I was wondering why the titular uh, uh, inference of the drop of water was more than the fly. The fly felt more portentous mm. to me. Mm. Oh, well, it's interesting. Then, it started out being called the fly. Um, really? Yes. And I think that, you know, at least this is from the, the this is, you know, all credit to Tim Lucas, who wrote a biography of Bava and his yeah. commentary. Um, but, but listening to his commentary, I guess that, you know, his reading or his take, and I don't know if this is informed from like, shooting scripts was that Baba realized it wasn't enough for the fly to be kind of the catalyst of the fear. And so changed it to the drop of water. Oh, wow. Um, kind of during shooting or maybe, you know, it was in the script, but, but that was the thing to enhance, which is why I think the fly follows her back to her apartment too. And there's that shot that's kind of in you know, fly, fly cam um, yeah. following her, even when she's out of the, um, out of the house. Uh, but yeah, it just wasn't enough of a, a motif that they could keep going and don't they even drop a cat into her apartment as well so like it's it's really all the signs of oh, right. the spirit yes. being there yes. 
mm. just kind of layers added on, which is just terrific. Oh, that's it. I didn't know that. I, I even have the Tim. I have the Tim Lucas book sitting next to me, and uh, um, you know, <laughs> thinking that at some point I would. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was reading through it last night, and I didn't see that. That's interesting. I was skimming, that's admittedly. And I was I curious. I was curious if anybody knew uh, David or Niall or anybody uh, who did the rewrite. Uh, Cause it's not, I'm not finding the credits for anything in the AIP, like in terms of the re revisions uh, because it is just the, the Italian, there we go. <laughs> it is just the Italian. What was the screenwriter's name? Oh, Marcello Pondato. And then Baba and another person kind of contributed, but you don't find anything on IMDb or anywhere where like who the script doctor was on the, the AIP side of things. And clearly there was somebody there making those decisions or making those revisions. Yeah, I don't know. I do know that um, a different person is credited with the the intro with Karloff in the AIP version, but that the mm. interstitial ones, you know, the ones introducing the stories, which are, are not really in the Italian version, were shot by Bava himself, um, which okay. is why there's that kind of playfulness with the reflection of the drop of water and some of that, and why also he's probably in that, what well, looks like a very fine Italian suit. <laughs> So Baba shot all of all of that stuff. It wasn't uh, nobody else, you know, kind of did reshoots. It was they went back to Bob and said, hey, we need additional material. Well, I think there's just a, actually he filmed them simultaneously, is, is my understanding, um, except oh, wow. for the, the very intro, the, the intro. They didn't like that. It was this kind of outer space background in the Italian version of this kind of alien landscape. Um, they wanted it to be something uh, more. And so when it's Karloff's just head draped in black velvet to look kind of like a disembodied head like uh, Alicia Cook in um, House on Haunted Hill. Right, right. Um, right. Yeah. That's somebody else. And I forget who it is. He names it in the commentary, but I think it was a assistant editor, maybe. I'm sure it's in here, but I'm afraid that by going through the pages, your sound is just going to be. <laughs> so I won't do that. <laughs> also, it's a big book. It, it's yeah. huge. It's huge. It's and awesome. I have it. This is the first time uh, in a while that I take it off the shelf. And now I'm, yeah, I, I feel like now I need to reinvestigate Bob all over again after watching this. Excellent. When did that book come out again? I mean, while. at the time, I think it was like a $125 book, which was a lot of money. Now to think about what a book like that would cost today. Well, it's uh, copies sell for like two grand. If you, yeah. if you try yeah. to find mm -hmm. a, a used copy of it now, I mean, they're, they're what is really the name of the book, David, just for, so our listeners can is start. The getting on eBay? No, Mario Baba, all the colors of the dark. Oh yeah. It's 2007. Ah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I remember when it came out and be going, who would spend $125 right on a there. book? Yeah. Yeah. And you and you and John Kitley and Lawrence and, and I have one <laughs> right over every, there. Yeah. Everybody on this panel except for me. It was the first. It wasn't the last expensive book that I purchased, but it was one <laughs> of the first for sure. Well, thank you all so much. This was uh, this was delightful. And I, I, I was like, I would love to have this group of people to discuss this movie. So thank you very much. Because Lawrence and David, uh, you were def David White. You were definitely key to my appreciation of Italian horror and uh, Niall and David, you and I have enjoyed uh, several Italian things together. So it was nice to have everybody in the same room. Uh, looking forward to doing this again in the not too distant future. It's great to meet everyone. Yeah. yeah. Great to meet you guys. Until next time, keep searching, keep exploring and keep sharing the scare.